Hello, my name is Marcus Brand. I'm the head of mission of International IDEA in Myanmar. And I'm here today with my colleague and friend, Budi Karki, who is a senior advisor, constitutional lawyer for International IDEA in Nepal. And we will be talking about lessons learned and experiences from Nepal's process of introducing and implementing a federal constitution. And we hope that this will be interesting for an audience in Myanmar, but maybe beyond the country as well. Budi, you are here in Bangkok today, uh, sharing information, sharing experiences with our colleagues about the, ex the experience that you've built up in the last 15 years uh, or so. We worked together in UNDP many years ago. Now we're both with International IDEA. And you have seen in Nepal the process of uh, designing, conceptualizing a federal constitution and have now seen seven years of practical experience of turning that into reality. I wanted to ask you a few questions and thank you also for taking the time and uh, sharing your, uh, your insights. Uh, what would you say in general are the key takeaways from this process? Has it been a success? Has it been a failure or is it too early to say? Thank you, Marcus. Um, you know, it's a, it, it's a fascinating experience of, you know, being involved in eight years of constitution making and uh, seven years of uh, constitution implementing. And I feel really, really fortunate to be a part of it and having a sort of ringside view in the constitution making process. Uh, it's a fascinating process. It's, uh, uh, and then uh, it, being involved in that constitution implementing process is even more fascinating. Going to your question, um, what are the major takeaways and whether I, I uh, take this constitution as a success or failure? Uh, there are so many takeaways. Uh, you know, we had such a thrilling constitution making um, experience, uh, you know, the process started in 2007, uh, 2006, uh, and then the first Constituent Assembly was elected uh, in uh, May 2008, which was supposed to make a constitution in two years' time, but it took four years. And then the Constituent Assembly got dissolved in, uh, without producing a constitution in 2012 uh, uh, May. And of course, it started after a 10-year violent conflict that had yes. torn the country apart, a lot of trauma, a lot of displacement, a lot of killing. So it was the culmination of a peace process that uh, led to the demand for a federal inclusive constitution. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's why, you know, uh, that four year of constitution making uh, after that violent uh, uh, conflict uh, of 10 years uh, conflict where, you know, around 7,000 people uh, lost their lives and so many displaced and uh, whatever. Uh, and then two years of painful, that early peace process and then elections, then four years of uh, that uh, uh, constitution making exercise. And suddenly, you know, constituent assembly uh, dissolved without produ producing a constitution. A lot of people got disappointed and they thought that constitution, uh, that, that constituent assembly was a failed constituent assembly. But I don't agree because a lot of issues were resolved during that four year uh, uh, constitution making process. Then we got another election, second constituent assembly was elected and in second constituent assembly was was uh, able to produce a constitution in uh, in less than two years time. Uh, so we got our new federal democratic constitution in 2017. And then the first elections took place of all the spheres of government. And then uh, recently we had a second uh, local government elections. And in November we are um, we are having the second federal and provincial elections. So if you see all this thing in, uh, you know, I mean, we have got a lot. 
Um, it was really a very, uh, because I am a competitist, you are a competitist. From competitive pros perspective, you know, Nepal's constitution making process, overall peace process, although there are certain issues yet to be resolved, but I would consider the constitution making peace process a really a successful process. And so overall, one can say at least peace has been maintained. Yes. The monarchy has shifted successfully to a republican form of government, a democratic form of government. Yes. And many steps have been made towards inclusion and participation. Yes. And so, secularism, of course, has yes, a very important element. Federalism, secularism, republicanism in a country like Nepal. You know, uh, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have imagined that one day Nepal would be a republic a federal country, uh, uh, a secular country, and uh, an inclusive, uh, Nepal would be much more inclusive society. So, and uh, peace uh, was restored, and most importantly, you know, we never had that, that threat of going back to another conflict. So, uh, up to the constitution making, I, I feel that Nepal's peace process and constitution making process was highly successful uh, because it resolved so many issues that Nepali society had been having for centuries. And then, uh, you know, whether, you know, federalism or the new constitution is successful or not, it's too early to say. Uh, it's too early to judge. Uh, many people uh, in Nepal. Uh, feel that you know uh, federalism has not worked uh, well, uh, but what I say, being a part of the implementation of this um, constitution and supporting federalization process, again we have to see uh, in a competitive perspective. Uh, if you see that the countries which adopted federalism to address certain issues related to diversity no country has been as successful as Nepal federalism has in early five, six years. So um, in Nepal, the problem is, you know, in 70 years time, this is our seventh constitution. Uh, we changed the constitution as uh, one changes the court. And we never give the system to properly function. We never give time for the system to be tested. And too early, we, um, we made the judgment that, okay, system uh, is not working. Um, but um, I think, you know, uh, their uh, Nepali federalism is, federalization process has too many positives. And it's, it's uh, natural that initially, you know, federalism is a compact system, as, you know, Ron Watts uh, very uh, eloquently says. Uh, a country, um, uh, the federalism is not difficult, actually, a complex system. Federalism is adopted because uh, the, the issues are complex. So if a system is designed to solve the complex problems, you know, it's not easy. I mean, uh, that's why I think uh, Nepal's federalization process is really going to the right directions, although there are certain issues um, that needs to be resolved, like, you know, um, uh, sometimes we feel that, you know, it's too early. Uh, the federalization process is more democratization process in Nepal, more devolution, uh, process of devolution, process of decentralizing, political devolution, political decentralizing. And somewhere, you know, there is a recentralization, uh, de facto recentralization process because, you know, conservative forces, the bureaucracy certainly wants to um, wants to uh, recentralize it more, which is natural. So one of the interesting features is, of course, that the federal constitution not only created a federal tier of government, but constitutionalized three tiers of government, three s spheres of government, the federal, the provincial, as well as the local. And I think the creation of a very strongly constitutionalized own sphere of local government is perhaps one of the most interesting 
uh, also from a comparative perspective. So would you, how would you see and describe the relationship between these three tiers of government? Yeah, this is, uh, I think, among the federal countries also, there are fewer federal countries where the constitution establishes, recognizes uh, local government as third sphere of government. So we, uh, in Nepal, we uh, established a three sphere uh, federal structure with constitutionally distributed exclusive and concurrent powers and then a design to, you know, state powers, uh, uh, power has been um, devolved in three spheres of government and to exercise these state powers, the state resources also constitutionally designed, uh, through constitutionally designed process, the state uh, resources are distributed among these three spheres of government. And uh, you are right that there are very few federal countries with such a powerful, constitutionally established, powerful local governments with the jurisdiction competence to provide, deliver the services, as well as de deliver the development. So our local governments not only provide, uh, you know, deliver the services that national government uh, uh, decides to distribute it to the people, but it also has development uh, competencies. So uh, the roads and the, the drinking water, building schools and hospitals, uh, uh, health posts come under the jurisdiction of local government. So these are very, very powerful uh, local governments uh, constitutionally, even uh, from the federal perspective also. And recently, you know, our first uh, uh, local governments uh, completed their tenure and we had the second uh, election, look, election of second local government. And if you compare how these three spheres of government have been functioning in last five years, uh, whether they are functioning according to the path the Constitution has envisaged, I would say that local governments have been more, uh, more successful compared to provincial and federal government to actually deliver, to actually, you know, deliver the, uh, uh, deliver uh, the, what people uh, have expected. Mm. I mean, uh, local governments are the government of, I, I would say that real government of people. Uh, they are the government closest to the people. And uh, the uh, local government representatives live among the people, unlike provincial or federal parliamentarian. You know, when they get elected, they move to a provincial or federal uh, capital. But the local government representatives live among them. And they have been doing pretty well. There mm. are issues because, you know, they are, they are the new constitutionally designed governments with new responsibilities with a lot of challenges, with high expectations of people, because, you know, for decades, you know, Nepalese people were living so far from the government. So past five years, Nepalese people are living closer to the government and getting services mm. uh, from the government. They are closer to people. There are issues. I mean, the capacity of local government, we can, we can question because, you know, uh, a lot of uh, local government representatives are not formally well educated or well educated. But uh, overall, you know, I would say in five years time, Nepal's local governments can be termed uh, the most successful governments in, uh, in Nepal. And that's also, of course, very interesting because a lot of the de original demand for federalism came out of uh, decades or centuries of uh, a feeling of marginalization of exclusion and the agenda to, uh, to be non-discriminatory, to be inclusive, was very much packed into that original push for federalism. And uh, what is interesting is that the elements of inclusion and diversity and uh, equal representation were also baked into the design for local government. And this is really interesting if you could tell us a bit more about how that has actually uh, shaped up and, and how that has been designed and also what uh, you have been doing to, uh, uh, to further uh, develop this kind of process. 
Yeah, to understand the demand, where the demand of federalism comes and how the Constitution has incorporated these demands and aspirations of people, we have to go a little uh, deep into uh, how Nepali Constitution has addressed this. You know, um, Nepali co uh, peace process, the, the two key tools of Nepali peace process is um, a constitution through a constituent assembly elected by the people, so which means that participatory constitution making. And the aim of that participatory constitution making was to make, uh, to restructure the state um, so that, uh, you know, uh, the discrimination various forms of discrimination that existed in Nepali society could be, could be uh, addressed, uh, eliminated through the state. That's why state restructuring was the key uh, you know, tool uh, to address this discrimination. So in state restructuring, there are various strands of uh, state restructuring. One is federalization, another is inclusion, and another is, you know, uh, restructuring the electoral process, right? And then there are a lot of fundamental rights that, uh, that uh, um, you know, uh, addresses the discrimination. There are uh, rights of women, rights of Dalits, and rights of Janjatis uh, are guaranteed in the fundamental right. Uh, the electoral system is reformed as a mixed electoral system where, which ensures 33% of women representation and representation of Dalit and Janjatis and other marginalized, historically marginalized communities as per the population. It's then, a mix of uh, proportional system and proportional system first past the post. and first past the post system. That's why you know our um, uh, assemblies uh, from federal level to uh, provincial level to local level assemblies are really inclusive. There is 33 percent of women representation in uh, House of Representative of Federal Parliament, lower House of Federal Parliament, and uh, um, provincial assemblies. 35% of women representation is ensured in National Assembly, upper house of the federal parliament. 40% of women representative is ensured in local government. So uh, along with this, you know, there the uh, uh, inclusiveness in bureaucracy, in police force, in army force, all these are ensured, you know, ample, uh, representation of women and Dalits and other marginalized groups. So inclusion, uh, reform in the electoral system, and then distributing the state powers in three spheres of government, that is whole, that is the state restructuring in Nepal. And these all things end along with a lot of social and economic rights, along with civil and political rights as fundamental rights, right? So this is how the whole, uh, you know, uh, a design to address the century-long uh, discrimination was designed. So, yeah. And what have been the, let's say, insights when you look back now, 10 years ago, what, what would you say should have been paid more attention to or what should have been more prioritized during the that preparatory period or planning period before the enactment of the new constitution. Or if you look, for example, to Myanmar, which is several years behind that kind of process in designing a new federal structure, what key advice would you give on what is important to focus on at this point? Well, you know, we have, as I earlier uh, discussed about the painful and long prolonged constitution making process, you know, uh, Nepal being a very, very diverse country, having, you know, uh, over 120 caste ethnic groups and speaking uh, 125 um, language dialects, a very diverse country with very diverse aspirations, expectations from people. You know, people had real high expectations while designing federalism. People thought that, you know, designing federalism according to the wish they, uh, according to what they wanted would solve all of their problems. Uh, and everybody, major 
federalized federalism forces, pro-federalist forces were very much stuck into uh, the names, numbers, and boundaries of uh, the provinces. Um, and uh, that was one of the major reasons why first constituent assembly did not produce the, uh, the constitution because the political forces could not agree on name, names, numbers, and boundaries of the provinces. Looking back, what I feel is very little uh, time, effort, energy was invested in distribution of state powers. What, what should be the powers of federal uh, government? What should be the power of provincial government? What should be the power of local government? Very little time and effort and energy was invested. And because of that, you know, one of the I mean, there are, I'm not saying that Nepali constitution is perfect. Nepali constitution is adequately federal to begin with. And you know, uh, because uh, the amendment of constitution, there, there are demands of amendment of constitution. The constitutional amendment process in a federal country is naturally very complex. And in Nepal, it's even, uh, even more complex. But what I think is that if we move this properly, a lot of structural problems can, can be solved through a right process. You know, through federalization process, we can, we can um, you know, um, uh, repair them. For example, you know, if somebody says that why 33% women representation, why not, uh, why not 50% because women make more than 50% of the population. But the Constitution does not stop you to make it 50% or 70%, right? Then there are so many other, other issues. But what is the major problem we are facing in Nepali federalization process is that very sort of not well thought distribution of state powers. Um, there is a lot of, you know, we have five lists of competencies. And these, uh, list, uh, these competencies of federal, provincial, and local level government are uh, at times very uh, overlap a lot. Uh, and uh, that makes the conflict. As earlier you asked what sort of relationship all these three spheres of government share. You know, in any federal country, in the federal, the, the um, intergovernmental relationships evolve um, uh, during the course of federalization process. Uh, in America, for example, you know, until 1950s, I think, there was no formal law to regulate the intergovernmental relationship in American federalism. But in new federalism like us, you know, we have got a lot of uh, intergovernmental mechanisms in the Constitution, and there is a federal law that, uh, that has designed the various structure, structures and mechanism to maintain the intergovernmental relationship. Politically, you know, um, uh, if you say, because the, uh, because the distribution of power is not very clear cut, and there is a lot of overlapping, uh, the, especially the relationship with local government and province, between local government and provincial government is not very pleasant. You know, uh, the federal government and local government, they share good relationship. Uh, there is not much complaint, but provincial and local government relationship is not very good. And provincial and federal uh, government relationship also is very sticky. There are several cases in the constitutional bench of Supreme Court filed by uh, provinces because the federal laws, um, uh, because they claim that federal laws encroach the provincial jurisdiction. So these are in the early phase of federalization process. This is natural. And you have that in even long-standing established federal systems. Of course. I mean, the whole American yeah. federal system yeah. is actually the, the tension between federal and state government, exactly, right? Yeah. So. Uh, the, the Supreme Court plays a lot of role, the, po the judicial uh, process and political process and legislative process. The federal system uh, moves ahead. But in Nepal, this is more complex. The relationship is more complex. And there are a lot of risks because the constitution makers did not give ample importance and time while 
distributing, designing the distribution of uh, state powers. So Nepali masses to the new, the, the countries which are going through federal design, I would say that the most important thing while making constitution, federal constitution, is the distribution of state power among various spheres of government. That is the most important thing. And every day while uh, you know implementing that constitution, you will face that that, that determines whether uh, the federalization process is smooth or not. No matter how clearly you did, uh, uh, you you distribute the power, there is always tension. For example, in America, there is there is not much ambiguity because there is enumerated list, and then all other residual as a residual power goes to the state. But still, there are hundreds of cases every year that go to the Supreme Court. You cannot distribute the state powers in a watertight way but you can do a lot to make it less ambiguous, right? In our case, we didn't do that well. Other thing, I would say, you know, with the time, it will, it will improve. But distribution of powers um, is very, very uh, complicated because the constitution makers did not give much attention, care, and importance to that distribution. So what I would say, ultimately, in a longer run, you know, name of the, uh, of the province or a state or a constituent unit may give you some abstract sense of satisfaction, right? Number of provinces might be later on uh, become irrelevant, especially for the people, not for the elites, but for the people, name might not in the long run matter, number might not. Several of the provinces still don't have a name. Yes, one of the provinces still does not have the name, and people are people don't complain, right? Uh, this is the failure of the provincial government because the constitution has given the authority to name the province to the provincial assembly, provincial government, and that is the failure of provincial government. But people don't much care. What people care is what type of services they are getting from federal government, what type of governance they are getting from provincial government and federal government and local government. Ultimately, what matters is what role the constitution gives to the provincial government and local government and federal government, and what people get from them. That's why distribution of powers I would say is very, very important and where we did pretty well in other aspects, inclusion, design, re redesigning the electoral system, federalization, we did pretty good job. But uh, in the distribution of powers, I think we, we could have done much better. Let us end maybe on an observation from your work with local government on inclusion. Um, as you say, this is one of the maybe success stories of the whole project. Uh, of building a new constitution, and could you say in what way this this new space for participation for women, for Dalits, uh, for local communities, how that has impacted the quality of democratic culture at the local level, uh, and in what way does that change in a way um, the the nature of uh, Nepal as a as a democratic society? Yeah, you know, a Nepali constitution envisages to build a sort of egalitarian society where you know everyone lives uh, with dignity uh, with his or her one identity with dignity an egalitarian society where no discrimination exists uh, and it's very sort of very ambitious uh, you know um, objective to achieve but if you see Nepal's local goal the local governments are really inclusive because there is a 40% representation of women is insured. Mayor or, and deputy mayor, uh, at least one female uh, you know, representation is insured. And even in the executive, because if you see in Nepali, uh, you know, although the constitution says that all state organs uh, must be, shall be, uh, shall be inclusive, but it gives the number only in the assembly, parliament, 
33 percent of women and uh, the Janjatis and Dalits all are represented, but the, the, the executive, the cabinet, is not inclusive. You know, there is uh, no 33% of women and others. Uh, in provincial assembly, uh, inclusion is ensured, but again, executive, if you see executive, is not that inclusive. But in local government, inclusion is ensured in the executive also, in making government, where decisions are made collectively. The mayor cannot dictate, although in practice, still mayor uh, may dictate, but later on slowly, you know, that will change. So the local governments in Nepal, um, in I think every local governments are the real governments of people because they are, they, they are closest to the people and uh, the government representatives live with the people. And uh, they are very, closely they can be they are scrutinized by people and whatever they do the people know in in our local government you know although there are issues of corruption and all but it is very difficult for a local government representative to be corrupt for example if a local government representative if a mayor for example although the mayor does not make a procurement uh, the mayor decides the procurement, uh, make the decision, and the bureaucrats uh, procures the uh, uh, the decision, uh, the the goods. Uh, but people know uh, the price of a chair, for example, right? So our local governments are, in the real sense, they are the government of people, which is very inclusive. I mean, there is the uh, represent forty percent of representation is insured in local government and even in the For executive women. yeah woman woman's representation forty percent woman's representation is insured and local governments are basically you know the who is who gets elected is the people uh, the community who uh, has majority yeah, inclusion is there i mean uh, and decisions are made collectively yeah and decisions are made collectively even the executive is is inclusive there are at least four or five women uh, members in the executive there are two dalits uh, dalit members in executive and the decisions are made collectively the decisions have to be made in majority i mean our local government operation act prescribes that uh, decisions as much as possible, make the decision in consensus, and if consensus is not achieved, then majority, which means that sometimes decisions may be made, could be made um, without, the, uh, without the consent of the mayor. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they are really, really inclusive uh, local governments. Uh, although, you know, I, I, I won't say that all local governments, uh, the decisions are made collectively, but because of the system, uh, you know, slowly these women and Dalits are asserting their roles in, they were never in decision-making table earlier. Now they are in the decision-making table. And then there are a lot of, that's why the, the real support to federalization process in Nepal is to support these representatives from women and Dalit and marginalized communities to go to the table, decision-making table, and play that role. That's why international idea, what international idea is doing, one of the things international idea is doing is supporting the local government representatives to take part in that political deliberation while making decisions. That's why, and, and this is working very well. Now we have, in past five years, we have um, generated a lot of lessons uh, from the work we have been doing in several local governments of several provinces, where if you, you know these local government representatives, especially women, Dalits, and from marginalized communities, they might not be well educated. But when you explain them their roles and responsibilities, and help them how they can play this role. They don't need to be educated, you know, because they know the issues of their community much more than any expert would know. Only the thing, they, only the help they need is how to bring these issues to the decision-making table, how to present these issues uh, in, uh, in a reasoned way with evidences. And if you help them this, you know, then they can challenge the mayor uh, and other, uh, you know, dominant members 
to uh, to be listened. So this is this is working pretty well. Well, thank you very much for sharing this, and this gives us some good insights on how it is possible through a participatory constitution building process to bring democracy to the local level in a poor, conflict-affected society. And this may be some inspiration for other countries, such as in Myanmar as well. And hopefully, we will be able to uh, follow your process, your progress, uh, and share more such experiences also with our friends in Myanmar. Thank you, Marcus. It's, uh, it, it was a pleasure talking to you. I mean, yeah, Nepal, uh, you know, uh, we, when we were designing our constitution, although it took eight year, um, uh, eight long years, uh, I think we did not, um, you know, look at other similar countries. We, although we looked at uh, South Africa, but we didn't go there. Our constitution makers traveled throughout the world, but they didn't go to the country which uh, went through the similar process and you know which were similar. I think we can uh, we can have a lot of uh, uh, Nepal from Nepal Nepali process of constitution making and constitution implementing. I think there are lessons to be learned. But as a comparatist, you know I know that competitive knowledge has strengths. You can help uh, take help of competitive knowledge, identifying the issues, understanding them. But uh, to solve the issue, competitive knowledge does not help, or should not. Uh, competitive knowledge should not be taken to solve the uh, the issues. But again, uh, you know, um, I, I'm sure there is a lot of uh, uh, space to learn from Nepali process to understand the issues to identify the issues and understand the issues and take, uh, uh, you know, lessons from not only what has worked in Nepali process, but what hasn't. Uh, today, as I said, I was there for eight years in constitution making process. After supporting the federalization process, constitution implementation process for five years, now I think if I were there, I would have done certain things differently, or I would have suggested the politicians to do certain things differently. So I'm sure um, there is something to learn from the Nepali uh, process, and uh, it's a real pleasure talking to you. We'll certainly continue the conversation. Yes. Uh, we want to thank you for watching today, and if you're interested in the uh, constitution building process in Myanmar, but also in Nepal, uh, we encourage you to contact us or check on our website. Uh, and we hope that this was interesting for you and that you will uh, continue to follow us. Thank you.